Welcome to the Boneyard with Steve Robertson. As always, I am your good friend and host, Steve Robertson. Here on the Hump Day edition of the Yard, we got a lot to discuss. We do. Uh, the first thing that I want to talk about is uh, you guys, we've got to be weather aware. And uh, we got some folks kind of in harm's way out there. Our thoughts and prayers go out to them. Uh, listen, stock up on the milk sandwiches. You know how this thing's going to work. Uh, get some uh, water in the bathtub, all that kind of stuff. And I don't know how much that stuff helps, but uh, I'll tell you this. If your water is off, you're going to be glad you've got water in the bathtub. You don't drink it. It's, um, you know, it's really there to help flush the toilet. And I guess if you need to boil some water, you got that too. Uh, but all that I understood, uh, we've got some things out there and people are like, hey, it's going to be just a category one. Guys, there could be some tornadic activity. There's a lot to go with these storms. Let's all kind of, uh, you know, kind of come together as we Mississippians generally do. That's one thing I respect about our people. Uh, there is a quiet dignity about Mississippians. And we, while we may have our differences about sports and politics and things of that nature, in times of a crisis, I don't think there's anybody better in the world uh, than Mississippians. We really do come together uh, in times like these. And as a result of the uh, pending weather, the Hardy concert for Thursday night has been postponed to Friday, which happens to be Hardy's birthday, according to his social media posting yesterday. So if you have tickets for the show and you're planning to attend, do not show up on Thursday if you need a refund, you can get that done upon a purchase. But uh, yeah, Friday is the show. Now, some people have also asked me, I've had multiple messages from people about, uh, is there a fall baseball scrimmage this weekend? There is not, especially with the show now on Friday. Uh, we don't start fall baseball until September 23rd, September 23rd. And uh, my hope is, is that that uh, very sacred patch of grass We'll be in good shape. You know, we've got some pretty heavy equipment out there for this show. And a lot of uh, rain on the way could be kind of a pain getting all that stuff out there without damaging the field. And that's, uh, yeah, that's part of the deal, man. It, it truly is. And we hadn't done many of these shows out here, but this is a pretty major production. We were there on campus just yesterday, and uh, they're, they're setting up. And, of course, a lot of that is kind of having to be delayed a little bit because of this weather. And so it's important to kind of understand it takes a lot to pull this thing off. Uh, it's a big deal. A lot of you folks are excited about it, and as you should be. I love Hardy. I do. I'll be covering a high school football game Friday night, and so you guys uh, enjoy the show for me. But be aware of that. And for all of you out there, that, um, especially in those low-line areas, uh, near those tributaries, there's some discussions about uh, could be up to 10 inches of rain. If you've kept up with things, and this thing kind of snuck up on us a little bit, but uh, here is the, uh, you know, I guess, the latest update from uh, the Mississippi Emerg Emergency Management Agency. It's, uh, it's important to keep up with this stuff, too. I mean, it really is. But um, they're saying damage and winds potentially up to 65 miles an hour expected later today as Francine moves into Mississippi overnight. Some areas could see up to 10 inches of rain. Continue to monitor the forecast through trusted sources. Have a go kit and evacuation plan ready. Uh, that's, uh, that's from, you know, the folks that kind of help us here. You know, those are the folks that kind of keep us you're kind of apprised of what's happening. Again, that's the Mississippi Emergency Management Agency. I would encourage you to give them a follow on uh, Twitter or X at MSEMA. That's Mississippi Emergency Management Agency. Uh, they will kind of keep you prepared. There's also some helpful hints and things like that. Uh, it's, it's kind of old hat for a lot of us. You know, we've kind of grown up uh, living this close to the Gulf of Mexico. We've always had to deal with some of this stuff. But uh, one of the things I think it was a good decision to, you know, you know on Hardy and the university's uh, you know, behalf to postpone the show, you know, the last thing that we want is people taking to the roads, trying to get to a show, thinking things are going to be okay, and then something happened. I mean, the optics on that just aren't great. We don't want people to put themselves at risk uh, to come to a, to a concert. And uh, Hardy's people, amazing people. And I've met Hardy. Many of you have. He is a bulldog through and through. I know how jacked he is for the show. 
But uh, yeah, the right decision was made. And I know it impacts some people negatively. Some people were planning to go Thursday night. Uh, and maybe you've got a high school football player or cheerleader or band member uh, within your family. And so now you're having to kind of, you know, pick and choose or maybe sell your tickets because you got to go support your own kid on Friday. I, I get it. Everybody does. Uh, but uh, that's important to understand. So Hardy Show, Friday, doors at 4. Uh, they do have one act that can't make the uh, the bill, but it will be a good night. And, you know, Hardy, you know, being a bulldog and, you know, growing up just down the road here, he's going to put on a big show. It's going to mean a lot to him to be at Duty Noble Field. Uh, pretty special occasion. And, uh, you know, we'll recover that grass, you know. That's the thing I always think about, man. It's like there, there's just some things that, uh, that you worry a little bit about, but we have very professional people uh, that can accommodate that. But uh, it may take a little time, you know. It, it, I mean, you, got some, you got some cranes out there, man. you got heavy equipment out there on that field. And it's not like it's just a pasture. I mean, this is our playing surface, you know, the greatest playing surface in all of college baseball. So part of the deal. But uh, they'll get it all taken care of. Let's thank our friends at Bulldog Burger Company, longtime sponsors of this show. I love Bulldog Burger Company. I love the whole Eat With Us group. I've eaten a lot at Harvey's here as of late. It's very conveniently located right there by our spa, right there on 12. But uh, every time that I go and get food, whether it be in person or I get it to go, which is kind of what I do as of late, it's been great. Whether it's Harvey's or the Greer or Bulldog Burger Company, and listen, when your kids come to town with you, when you ask them, hey, where do you guys want to eat? More times than not, they're going to say, hey, let's go to Bulldog Burger Company. Go in there and have the spring rolls as your appetizer. They'll make you and everybody around you better looking. Get that great restaurant quality hamburger. Get the chocolate shake to go. You'll be glad you did. And with school back in session, I guarantee you there's a student within your circle of influence You know, whether it be your son, your daughter, your niece, your nephew, somebody from your church, just maybe a friend of the family, let me encourage you to do this. Go to eatwithus.com and get a gift certificate and send to them. Maybe you can't make it to town, take them out for a meal. Let them have a meal out on you. Yeah, those gift cards are great. Great. So many options to choose from, for sure. Uh, Three great locations to serve at University Drive in Stark Vegas, Gloucester Street there in Tupelo, Lake Harbor Drive in the Ridge and Flowood area, Bulldog Burger Company, the place where people go to meet. M-E-A-T. Okay, I promised you guys on Monday we were going to spend a lot of time talking about Toledo. I have done a lot of research here since we have been together and kind of checked some things out. So let me share with you what we've learned. All right, the obvious stuff, obviously, Toledo's 2-0. and They opened up the year with a 49-10 win over Duquesne's, and then they beat UMass last weekend. And, and there really there was separation there in the second half. Uh, it was 17-16, to and then really kind of the rest of the game was about the Rockets. UMass scores about three minutes late to kind of make it look a little less lopsided than it truly was. But, um, yeah, that's kind of how they've gotten here. And uh, they'll play Mississippi State, of course, then travel to Western Kentucky, and then get in a league play with Miami of Ohio, headed to the Glass Bowl. They go to Buffalo at Northern Illinois, host Bowling Green at Eastern Michigan, host Central Michigan, host Ohio, and then close it out with the Fighting Jim Moorheads uh, in Akron. And so this is the most important game when you look at it for like from a national perspective, like what do you want to do for recruiting? Obviously, they want to win their conference championship. They're not picked to win it, but they're certainly in contention to do so. But it's a big game for them. First road game of the year for them. And uh, some interesting things that kind of jump out to me. The um, They have not been great offensively. And the offensive line has been, um, you know, a bit of a up-and-down proposition for them. And as a result, the running game hadn't been great. That's good news if you're a Bulldog, right? But I'm sure if you're Toledo, it's like, hey, maybe this weekend we can get things going. And they've scored a lot of points. They've got some non-offensive touchdowns that have helped. But uh, 43.5 points a game. I don't think they're going to score with that proficiency against Mississippi State. I don't. And if you look at them, they're kind of having to, you know, depend on explosive plays. But they're getting them. They're getting them. 
They run kind of a zone read, Dan Mullen-esque type offense. Jason Candle's been a guy that uh, has done a really good job in the MAC over the years, uh, considered one of the best offensive play callers in that league. But a lot of the elements that you'll see are very familiar, right? Uh, they do have some quarterback run. They do some inside handoffs. They do uh, you know some jet sweeps and things like that. There's some things that they do to kind of out leverage you, and that was an issue from St- for State last week. We got out leveraged on some plays. That's a coaching and an execution thing. Uh, looking a little bit deeper here, the uh, they've, they've allowed 16 and a half points a game, and again, it's a little bit skewed early on because you know you played Duquesne's in Week One. Uh, 15 rushing first downs, they've allowed 16. 16 passing first downs, they've allowed 19. Eight by way of penalty. So 39 total first downs for them, and they've allowed 38. But, um, you know, again, offensively last week especially, that they really, really misfired. As a team, they have ran for, uh, let's see, 281 yards, a net total of 250 when you back out the, uh, the negative plays. They're averaging 125 yards a game. I believe that's 95th in the country. They're allowed 124. But, yeah, that, that's, they're not big numbers. It's not, and we're, and we're going to break that down a little bit more here uh, a little bit later in this segment. But uh, 29 of 53 through the air, the numbers hadn't been great from a passing standpoint. Hadn't, hadn't turned it over, but it's been a bit of an adventure under center. 227 yards uh, per game, and some of that is kind of propped up and kind of elevated because of some big plays. It's not like they're just kind of methodically working down the field. Not like it's going to be a much different deal than we saw with Arizona State. Not just from a schematic standpoint, from a personnel standpoint. Uh, total offense for them, averaging 352 yards a game, allowing 334. They've scored 12 touchdowns and allowed just three. And a lot of that's because they've got a veteran defense. But this is also a defense that really hadn't been tested. The return game has been really good for them. We're going to talk about Jacquez Stewart here in a little bit. But, uh, you know, they, they are a team that kind of shortens the field by way of special teams. Punt return average for them, 22.3. Kick return average, 38.5. Now, some of that, again, is skewed a little bit because you had a 98-yard return last week. Uh, when the game was tied at 10-10, Stewart takes it back 98 yards untouched. Former state champion sprinter out of Miami Northwestern. Uh, they've picked off a couple passes, but they haven't thrown any, as we discussed a little bit earlier. But, um, yeah, they're a team, too. You know, penalty-wise, they will commit some infractions. Their opponents have done a lot more. So we got to play clean football. And we've had some pre-snap stuff, too. we got to clean that stuff up. But that's kind of disappointing to see that carry over in week two. we gotta, we got we to gotta play clean this weekend. On third down, the uh, Rocket offense is 9 of 24, just over 37%, 3 of 4 on fourth down conversions. Defensively, they've allowed eight first downs and 31 attempts. They're right at 25%, 26%, kind of getting it done. Uh, they have fumbled the ball twice, have not lost it. They have recovered two fumbles, six sacks, and two allowed. So, you know, we'll see how things go. Red zone have been really good, but their red zone defense has been atrocious as well. Uh, the Rockets, 9 of 10, scoring within the red zone. Their opponents, 7 of 7. So you get down close, they're having a tough time. Now, let's talk a little bit about this passing game. All right, Tucker Gleason's their guy. Uh, John Allen Richter played a little bit in the Duquesne's game. But Tucker Gleason... 23 of 47 on a year. You can do the math yourself, but I'll help you. It's just under 49%. So not even completing 50% of his passes. Big physical guy, but they've had some issues. Now, thrown six touchdowns, and again, one of them 73 yards. Yeah. Again, some explosives within this Jason Candle offense. But the thing that I think about is kind of like last week. When you've got a guy that struggles to throw the football, you know, make him beat you. Uh, Junior Vander Ross leads the team with seven catches, 152 yards total, a couple touchdowns. He, the recipient of the 73-yard 
uh, touchdown catch and run. Uh, Jawan Newton, six grabs for 138 yards and a couple touchdowns. Anthony Torres is a guy that uh, has been a very reliable receiver for them. Four grabs for him for a pair of touchdowns. And that's pretty much it. You know, they're, they're just not getting much out of the rotation. They're kind of just working with their starters. And again, with all of the attrition you have in the G5, and, and the MAC has been ravaged in recent years by the NCAA transfer portal, uh, it's going to be tough to build depth. Now, Willie Shaw is the lead running back, which is a little interesting. And uh, he is the uh, probably the biggest of the backs. He's listed at 5'11", 202. I don't know that I would go that far. I don't know if I want to get on that scale, to be honest with you. He is a, he is a bigger guy and bigger than the rest of the running back room, but he is not the Scadpo kid by any stretch. So he's not that brand of physical runner. He has 15 carries for 75 yards, and he is the leading rusher. Couple touchdowns. Tucker Gleason, the quarterback we discussed, he has eight carries for 50 yards. And he kind of runs enough to keep you honest, right? It's not necessarily a lot of quarterback power, but they do, again, have some zone read stuff where he'll elect to keep it at the match point. Now, Jacquez Stewart may be their most explosive player. The two years ago, he was their leading rusher. Last year, he was uh, kind of the Robin to Penny Boone's Batman. Uh, Penny Boone, of course, uh, left and transferred to Central Florida after rushing for 1,400 yards last year for Toledo. And so Stewart is a guy they like to kind of get in space. And, of course, I I don't think that he is a guy that's going to get a ton of carries. He's had 11 on the season. They'll probably give him a few more opportunities this week because something may break, right? I think they're going to come out and try to establish the run because why wouldn't you after you see what Arizona State did last week? They're going to be a team – that uh, I think is going to try to find a way as as easily as possible uh, to kind of get the ball out in space because I don't think they can put together these 10, 12, 11 play drives. I just – I don't think there's enough proficiency under center, and I don't know that that offensive line is going to be able to hold up. I I really think we're going to see a bounce-back game for Mississippi State defensively. That's not to say that they're not – Toledo's not going to score. I mean, Jason Candle hadn't hung around – uh, as the head coach for nine years up there, and he was a longtime assistant and offensive coordinator before that, without knowing how to score. And they'll probably scheme some things up early, probably script some things early out there based on what we did last week, and something may hit. It's important to understand that. Good chance that happens. Now let's look at defense here. We talk about the veterans in this group, and there are. Uh, I think Jeff Levy said seven or 11 or six-year players. And that's one of the things I give Jacque Stewart a lot of credit for. You know, Jacque Stewart could have gone to Portal 2. Guys, he's been there. This is his sixth year of football. Redshirted in 19, 2020 didn't count, and 21, 22, 23, 24. Six years. Six years. So they've seen a lot, done a lot. Uh, Emmanuel McNeil Warren leads the defense with 21 tackles. He is a, a junior safety out of St. Petersburg, Florida a product of Lakewood High School, and uh, had 10 tackles against UMass last week. Big, physical, beefy type safety. You know, we're going to see him. Now, Braden Alls, number 26, really good player here. Great length, good catch radius. He's a guy from Sylvania, Ohio. Sophomore safety, six foot 196, but a great catch radius. And he's had two interceptions. He had an interception in each game. One against Duquesne and one against UMass. And the one against UMass was very, very, very important. It's like the, hey, the game was still in the balance. He picks it off and allows uh, Toledo a chance to go get some separation there. But uh, he wears number 26. You're going to see a lot of him. He is the second leading tackler uh, and the only guy on the team that uh, has picked off a pass. But um, very opportunistic, kind of a ball hawking guy in that respect. Uh, Avery Smith, six tackles. Jackson Barrow with eight. But again, you start running through these numbers, you're like Jackson Barrow is uh, a senior, you know, from Indianapolis. Uh, Maxon Hook, a senior, New Palestine, Indiana. Avery Smith, junior from East Point, Georgia. You know, so you've got some veteran guys on this group. Uh, you also have uh, a name that you may remember. 
Jadarius Perkins. Remember him? How he held us hostage on Christmas Day. We thought he was going to commit, and he talked to his grandmother and ultimately uh, didn't commit. Goes to Florida, winds up at Toledo. Uh, but, yeah, so in two games, he has made two tackles, a total of, excuse me, three tackles. Uh, so even there, he's not playing a tremendous amount. But, um, but nevertheless, a veteran group, and I think one of these things you start kind of looking through here, when you're a G5 team, you got to have leadership, you got to have experience. You're not going to show up and play an SEC team and expect to keep it close if you don't have some guys who played a lot of football. And they do. Uh, punting has been uh, interesting. As a team, they're averaging 39.71 uh, punts, uh, yards per punt. Emilio Duran, 42. That's, that's pretty good there. And then James Rowe is uh, just a couple punts for him, 34 yards. Kind of the short yardage guy. He's got both of his punts have been fair catches. You know, so it looks like Duran is kind of like the regular punter. And then when they have to kind of pooch it or kind of lay it up there, uh, Rowe has been that guy. But uh, interesting, you know, Emilio Duran, the, the five punts, again, 42 yards uh, per punt, has a long of 49. He has two inside the 20. Nothing beyond uh, 50 yards just yet. Now, field goals, Dylan Coonan, or Coonan, I apologize to the family, he is one of three on field goals. He made one uh, from uh, 20 to 29. Everything else, no good. He missed one from 30 to 39 and also one that was 50 plus. And so, you know, again, if it gets down to kicking, that should favor us. Uh, Emilio Duran also one of the kickoffs. Hey, fans, if you know me, you know I'm a dog person. I love them. I've got five of them. You've heard them on the show before. How about that? And so when things come up involving dogs, I'm always very acutely aware of it. And, you know, our, our friend, actress Catherine Heigl, kind of discovered there's a lot of dogs out there suffering with some health issues. And she said there were 16,000 dogs through her foundation says she's seen more and more issues with dogs' joints, odors, and health than ever before. After doing a ton of research, she feels there's one place we can look to support any dog's health. It's their food. So she decided to create something she could actually feel good about feeding her own dogs. It's called Superfood Complete. Superfood Complete is made with over 30 of the healthiest ingredients in the world including several superfoods vital to your dog's health. Badlands Ranch also supports the Jason Debus Heigl Foundation, which has helped rescue thousands of dogs and placed them in loving homes. How great is that? So what's interesting is uh, they sent me some sample products. Guys, I use it basically as a supplement, you know, just to kind of see how they'd like it. They would leave their regular food for the superfood complete. It's crazy. They absolutely love it. So go to BadlandsRanch.com slash Boneyard, and you can order right now and get up to 50% off your regular price order with a 90-day money-back guarantee. They're putting their money where their mouth is. If you want your dog to experience all these incredible things, go to B-A-D-L-A-N-D-S Ranch.com slash Boneyard. You'll be glad you did. Hey, Bulldog fans, you know, I'm the kind of guy, I like a discount when I can get it. Whether it be a Ken Folks discount, a good promo code, I like a great deal. But I'm not going to go jump through hoops to get it. You know, if you really want my business, make it easy for me to save some money, right? It's got to be easy. No nonsense. So when Mint Mobile said it was easy to get wireless for 15 bucks a month with a purchase of a three-month plan, I called them out on it. I said, there's got to be some red tape here. There's got to be some fine print I'm not seeing. Turns out it really is that easy to get wireless service for $15 a month. The longest part of the process is probably going to be the time you spend on hold waiting to break up with your old provider. It's so easy to switch. To get started, go to mintmobile.com slash boneyard. That's right, mintmobile.com slash boneyard. There you'll see that right now, all three-month plans are only $15 a month. That includes the unlimited plan. And you know what? During college football season, we need the unlimited plan. we got to call and text all of our friends when the Bulldogs win big. 
All plans come with high-speed data and limited talk and text delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. You can use your own number with any Mint Mobile plan. Bring your phone number with you along with all your existing contacts. Find out how easy it is today to switch to Mint Mobile and get three months of premium wireless service for just $15 a month. To get this new offer and your new three-month premium wireless plan for $15, bucks, go to mintmobile.com slash boneyard. Again, that's mintmobile.com slash boneyard. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash boneyard. 45 upfront payment required. That's equivalent, of course, to $15 a month. New customers on the first three-month plan only. Speeds are slower, above 40 gigabytes on a limited plan. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions may apply. See Mint Mobile for all details. Bustless, he has uh, six kickoffs, only one of those touchbacks. Michael Denning has seven kickoffs, three of those touchbacks. Spencer Conrad has two kickoffs, no touchbacks. So, 15 kickoffs on the year and just four touchbacks. What does that tell us, kids? We're going to have a chance to return something. That was the deal last week against Arizona State. Due to the air out there, due to the skill out there, and again, I know the air was thin, but that kid uh, from from Arizona State could really kick it. Um, We're going to have an opportunity to have some kick returns. And that's something we hadn't had a lot of, especially last week. And that's the thing you start thinking about with, you know, well, Kevin Coleman and, and Davin Booth and those guys, if you get a chance to make some plays in a return game, that could be a very big thing for Mississippi State. And so I do expect us to have a chance to bring one out. And, again, we'll be, it'll be interesting to see what they do with Kevin Coleman on these punt returns. That's something that I think was really missing last week. It's because of the fact, number one, we didn't make them punt much. And when they did, they kind of punted for possession rather than punting for distance. And when you have a lead, you can kind of do that. It's like, hey, we don't want to let Mississippi State sneak back in this ball game, so let's make sure we can punt something up there, maybe 42, 43 yards, and go cover it rather than just kind of let one rip and then out kick the coverage. And, you know, as dynamic as Kevin Coleman is, he can change the complexion of this game. So they did a good job. Will Toledo be able to do the same thing? I guess we'll see. But I think about this uh, Emilio Duran – you know, if he's giving you 42, 43, possibly 45 yards on a punt, if we do a good job blocking up the gunners on the outside, we give Coleman a chance. Because you remember how electric he was against Eastern Kentucky. You put that on film, everybody's like, whoa, you cannot let that kid beat you. So that'll be something that'll be very interesting as we kind of get into this. But uh, one of the things that I noticed by watching the uh, game against UMass while they weren't tested very often, I did not think that the corners at Toledo played very well. Uh, there was a couple of busts, and uh, there was one play in the red zone where the cornerback bought on the inside move and basically fell down, and the receiver just wide open in the corner of the end zone. Uh, so I, I think, number one, I don't think they have the athletes in the secondary to run with our receivers. And I don't think that they've got guys out there with enough depth. Like o- over the course of a game, you know, if we go out there and, and run tempo – I think when you get into that second half, I think you're going to have some guys really kind of gasping for air. And I do think State's going to score some points in this ballgame. I know what the defensive numbers have looked like for Toledo, but I think a lot of that, too, is probably quality of competition. I don't know if you've kept up. But that's what I'm here for, you know, is to kind of help you guys kind of stay apprised of what's happening in college football. Uh, I, I expect State to win this game. And I'll be honest with you, I think State – is going to cover this game, and I, and I think probably in the second half, State's really going to get some separation in this game. Uh, I don't think it's going to be a close game. I know some other people out there forecasting that it is. I, I don't suspect that's the case. I think with Toledo's offensive line issues that have really hampered their ability to run the football, and I think with their quarterback's inability to consistently complete passes – that uh, defensively, you're, again, you're going to see the bounce back game. And I think Mississippi State has a lot of frustration about how things started offensively last week. Uh, I think there's a good chance State probably comes out and scores on the first drive or two, if not both. I'm not a big fan of transitive properties when it comes to college football. 
But I think it's important to look and say, you know, hey, they're two and zero. But who have they beaten? Okay, uh, Duquesne's the Dukes are zero and two, and uh, they have been uh, beaten forty nine to ten and fifty six to nothing. And so again, you look at these defensive numbers, and it's like, hey, you, you've played a team that scored ten points in two games. That's it. What does that say? You know, about the quality competition. What does it say about the defense? They beat UMass last week. UMass now 0-2. They lose their first game to Eastern Michigan 28-14 and they lose to Toledo. So a little bit better offensive production. And, again, you start looking game to game with these guys at Toledo. You know, it's the, the Duke Gaines thing, you can just kind of throw that out. I mean, it's kind of like the Eastern Kentucky thing. I mean, it's like you, you get excited because of the fact that uh, you see your team score, right? You go out there and you put some points up and you feel pretty good about that. But I think when you get to the rest of this thing, it's like, hey, they haven't played anybody. They haven't. They're 2-0 and against two teams that are they're 0-2. Now, look at the game-by-game stuff here. This is what's interesting to me. I don't know how you guys feel about this. But, uh, you know, we, we look at the Decanes thing. Like, so 27 first downs to 15. That was the difference. Now, the flip side of last week, Toledo just 12 first downs. But, again, when you get a pick six, you get kickoff return, that kind of limits your offensive opportunities because you're giving the football right back. So I don't think you can you know, count a lot into that. But um, you start looking at these numbers. You know, it's like it's pretty interesting. You know, 83 yards rushing against UMass, and then 167 against Duquesne's. And so, you know, what should we expect? You know, I, I think we fully expect them to line up and try to establish the run. And maybe you, you get Gleason a little more involved there to kind of give yourself a little more mystery. But, um, you know, it's just, again, I, I don't know that we know anything about Toledo other than the fact that they have struggled offensively against some inferior competition, but have still found a way to win with some margin. And, again, I think that's culture. I think that's good coaching. You know, those guys at Toledo expect to win. You know, I, I don't know if you've kept up with the Rockets. Of course, it's our first time to ever play them. I don't know, I don't know if you guys have kind of put that together. The uh, first three opponents on Mississippi State's um, schedule this year, all first-time opponents. And, and Toledo, of the three, the only one of those three – uh, to to have a win over an SEC team, they beat Arkansas back in 15. Jason Candle was the offensive coordinator. It wasn't, wasn't an offensive shootout by any stretch of the imagination. You remember that crazy game we played against Arkansas too? It's crazy. It was nuts. But, again, three first-time opponents. I, I'm be honest with you. I kind of like that aspect of it. You know what I mean? I like the fact that we're able to kind of play some teams that we don't ordinarily see. It kind of adds a little bit of novelty to things. You know, I don't know how you guys feel about it, but I, I like the fact that, you know, the Power Five mandate, I think it's a great thing. I do. You may disagree, but that's how I feel. I think it's a great thing because it gives us a chance to take some trips we would ordinarily take. But, um, you know, just kind of looking back here, your recent years, the Soledo program has been good. You know, that they have been, for the, especially for their league. They have been very good. I mean, last year they go to the Arizona Bowl. They lose to Wyoming in a close ball game, 16-15. But they were in the Boca Raton Bowl the year before, back-to-back trip to the Bahamas Bowl, the Dollar General Bowl in 17, Camellia Bowl in 16, Boca Raton Bowl again in 15, the GoDaddy Bowl in 14, the famous Idaho Potato Bowl in 12, Military Bowl in 11. So, I mean, you start doing the math here. I mean, it's like you start in 10 – you know, 10, 11, 12 bowl games, no bowl trip in 13, bowl trips in 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, no bowl trip in 19, and of course, uh, you know, 2020 was a wild year. But uh, by and large, this team has been a winning program. <clears throat> they hadn't won a ton of bowl games as of late, but they have appeared in a lot of bowl games. Uh, so pretty impressive program that they've built up there, and uh, and, and hasn't been one, too, that's been propped up by a ton of transfers. That's a part of it, too. A lot of this is just how they get guys up there. Come, we talked about Jacques Stewart. Yeah, that's a guy that's been there now for six years. So, clearly, they're doing some things right at Toledo and Jason Candle. Those guys clearly 
taking care of their players and making them feel at home because you don't have a ton of guys leave. Uh, but they have had some. They have. Uh, but they haven't gone out and just kind of rebuilt. They've kind of done it the old-fashioned way. Yes, they've had some transfers, but they've also uh, just kind of built from within. And I think that's one of the reasons they've had such continued success is the fact that, hey, these are, these are young men that have elected to be a part of this program, uh, they love being up there. They appear to love the coaching staff. And, again, they've, they've played for some conference championships. And so uh, we're going to have our hands full. But, again, I think State, I think after after the uh, halftime adjustments, I think State takes control of this ball game. And I think State wins this game uh, double digits plus. I really do. I, I think we're probably going to see maybe more of what we want to see. And then we'll get ready for Florida. My hope is we can get through this game, win the game, get some separation, maybe get some playing time for some young guys late, start getting ready for Florida. Uh, that's the hope anyway. All right, time for today's top ten list. As always, brought to you by CloseWithBlair.com. That's C-L-O-S-E with Blair, B-L-A-I-R.com. Blair Chandler is my friend, your friend, our collective friend in the mortgage industry. Yeah, that's how it works. You need people. You need to know people that know things that you don't. It's the best way to navigate through life, right? You can't, you can't do it all. No matter what people tell you, you got to have people that have a level of expertise that you don't, especially over something as important as your mortgage. A lot of people just starting out in life. Maybe you've got that college degree. Maybe you want to plant some roots somewhere, get a condo. Maybe you're getting married, want to get your first house, a starter house, as they say. Maybe you're working through a life reset. You know, take some stress and anxiety off your plate and put it on the plate of one Blair Chandler. Give me a call or text today at 601-500-2344. Again, 601-500-2344. 23 years of experience in this industry. He can get you with the closing table when many other people can't. He knows how to construct loans in a way to get an approval through underwriting. You need to deal with people that know what they're doing. And that's Blair Chandler. Whether well, you're looking for a game day condo, your first house, your second house, your retirement home, Blair Chandler is the way to go. He's a bulldog through and through. It's a guy that uh, has a place here, season ticket holder, multiple sports. So he rides the wave right along with you. Uh, that's not to say that he won't do business with uh, fans of other schools. He certainly will. But uh, I believe in keeping business in the family whenever we can All right, time for today's top 10 list. And uh, I thought we would do something a little bit different uh, this week. We did some of these uh, back in football season last year. And uh, we got the the music of Toledo. You you may be surprised by this. Now, I had to work a little bit to put this list together, but you may be surprised the musical connections with the city of Toledo, Ohio. It's not all polka up there. It's not. So we've got a very uh, eclectic list in some respects. We got some R&B stuff. We got some real rock stuff. We got some pop stuff. We got some southern rock stuff, which is weird. Uh, got some heavy stuff. So the rock of Toledo. We'll start with this. Not really the rock. Maybe the music of Toledo. Number ten, the now defunct alternative rock band Lollipop Lust Kill. They created a big buzz up there. They were thought to be the next big thing to come out of Toledo. They did record an album. Probably the best track that I've heard on it is a song called Like a Disease. The thing that I would say about them is they kind of fit the era, right? They didn't really stand out. There wasn't anything really remarkable about them. They just kind of like, hey, well, that kind of sounds like you know, a little bit like Godsmack, you know, a little bit like this or that, you know, not quite as good but kind of fit the genre. All right, number nine. Again, working some R&B in today, too. Going back, you know, you guys remember uh, Computer Love and everything from Zap? Well, Shirley Murdoch was the female vocalist on that track. And everybody's heard it. You just didn't know who sang it. But uh, Shirley Murdoch had some, some solo success of her own. Had a huge hit called As We Lay. Very romantic song. She has a great voice. She truly does. Number eight, we got some Christian rock on the show today. Now, there's a handful of Christian rock bands from the greater Toledo area. To me, this is the best of the ones that I listen to. And I listen to a lot of them, try to get a sample. If it doesn't catch me right away, I move on. But there's a great band out of there called Sanctus Real. 
and maybe you've heard you know some of the praise stuff they do. A track called Rebel, ironically enough, on a Bulldog show. But uh, this is a song, you know, basically about kind of being different for the right reasons, right? Kind of going against the norm and not being of the world and things of that nature. Uh, I dig the track, man. I think you will, too. And if you're into Christian rock and you don't know Sanctus Real, let me encourage you to give those guys an opportunity. Uh, They've had a couple different singers, and uh, both of them have been very different, but both very talented. I think you'll dig them. Again, if you're a Christian rock fan, uh, grab some Sanctus Real and check them out. Number seven, R&B, and I started not to put this guy on here because he's had a lot of problems. He really has, and uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't. This is not about judging people, right? We're we're celebrating music. There's been some other people we've featured on this show at times that had some problems too. But uh, Life Jennings out of Toledo, again, kind of a, a real more of an R&B soul guy. Like R&B these days, like it used to be R&B was, uh, you know, kind of instrumentation type stuff. It wasn't all studio stuff. Uh, a lot of it kind of uh, you know, reminiscent of the Motown sound. And then R&B became kind of rap and R&B kind of mashed into one. Uh, but this is kind of more real R&B, but it's uh, Life Jennings Must Be Nice. And, uh, it, you know, and again, it's it, the production value on this album wasn't great. He's done a handful of albums. Maybe you know him, but uh, you know one of Toledo's most accomplished musicians. All right, number six. I didn't. Did you know that cousin Ruby from Black Oak, Arkansas, is from Toledo, Ohio? Did you know that? I didn't until today, and that was one of my first crushes. Was cousin Ruby? True story. So cousin Ruby was in a different band and ran into Black Oak, Arkansas at a bar, and Jim Dandy said, hired her on the spot, and said, hey, I want you to come be a part of our band. She joined, and uh, she was on the um, you know, mid-'70s run with them, and then did some solo stuff herself. It's, it's difficult to find that stuff, but uh, she died back in 95, a fairly young lady. But we're going to go off of the Street Party album from 1973. It's Black Oak, Arkansas, Son of a Gun. That's your number six track today. Now, number five, I admit I didn't know much about this band until I began to put this list together. And I really like them. They don't have the edge that I normally kind of equate rock music to. But it's a band called Citizen. And they're kind of reminiscent of like the early 80s alternative rock scene. Like some of that tuning. It's a little more harmonic than that stuff was. But I dig this band, man. And I think if you're an alternative rock fan and, and you're looking for a band that maybe is a little more muted, maybe it's not, you know, so loud and demonstrative, this might be the band for you. you got five albums out there, and we're going to go with a track called Can't Take It Slow. Really, really like this song. So if you're looking for a new band to get into that's maybe a little bit off the beaten trail, Citizens may be the band for you. Now, for you American Idol fans, we've got uh, a Toledo native that kind of got their start in Chicago and then rose to fame on American Idol. Her professional music career has not really taken off. Of course, uh, she signed the deal, and then there was all this uh, you know, restructuring and mergers and things like that, and she didn't get picked up, and then she signed another deal, but she's kind of out there playing. It's uh, Crystal Bower Sox. Remember her? Yeah, she had dreads. Cute girl. Um, she wrote a track called Farmer's Daughter. That's a pretty cool little song. A lot of wholesome Americana type feel in what she does. You know, one time Simon Cowell said she was the favorite to win that season. She didn't, but uh, I think that she'll enjoy that track. All right, number three. We're all over the place, man. We're all over the place. Told you guys it was an eclectic list. Number three, eight-time Grammy nominee, Anita Baker. This came up uh, you know, back in, in your good friend and host days of uh, being a program director at a radio station. We had a lot of Anita Baker on the playlist, especially during the day, back at WCJU. So we did. Uh, wasn't really my thing, but there is no denying her talent. Anita Baker, you talk about you know soulful, sultry. You talk about real R&B. It's Anita Baker. And I'm going to go with giving you the best that I got. And she had a lot of hits, but that's to me, that's... Very relatable song for a lot of people. All right, number two, this band has a huge following. I bought the first album. I did not buy any subsequent albums. And I know how you guys may feel. 
Um, there's a lot of people that are big Weezer fans. They're not a band that's really to be taken seriously. What I mean by that is, is like, they're just a fun band. Like, they're not going to go out there and write Stairway to Heaven, right? Uh, they're not write and live and let die. You know, like the, the sweater song. Like, if you want to destroy my sweater, just pull the string and walk away. It's, it's very silly in some respects. And I think that's one of the reasons that people like them. They are very talented musicians. And uh, you may not know this, but Scott Schreiner, the bassist in Weezer. Yeah, Toledo, Ohio native. We're going to go with El Scorcho is number two. El Scorcho. And some people may be easily offended by that. And my approach to that is if you get offended, then maybe you need to be offended. Number one, this is a band that you probably didn't realize had connections to Toledo, Ohio. It's Boston. You're like, Steve, there's no way. Yes. Yes, way, Ted. Yes. Tom Schultz, the founder of Boston, is from Toledo, Ohio. Did you know that? Dad was a house builder, and uh, he began to kind of tinker with things himself. He goes to MIT to learn to be a mechanical engineer, gets into music, was always into music, but began to build his own you know, his cabinets and mixers and things like that, and uh, recorded their early demos in his own basement. Of course, you know, MIT is in Cambridge. Well, there you go. There's your connection to Boston. But it all started in Toledo, Ohio. So we're going to go with uh, the title track of the second album. It's Don't Look Back. That's your number one track of the music of Toledo. Pretty impressive type stuff. I mean, honestly, I mean, hey, it, it's not a Mississippi list, but it's a great list. It truly is. And it gave us a chance to kind of highlight some, uh, some artists we don't talk about as much on the show. I don't know. We've done much with Weezer. And I know somebody's going to ask for a top 10 list. Maybe we do. We'll see. I was thinking today maybe I should do a Dead or Alive top 10. Most of you probably wouldn't. You're like, Steve, isn't that the, the uh, Spin Me Like a Record? Yes, it is. It is. And you think they don't have 10 hits, but they did. They did. Maybe eight. I'd have to kind of work on that. But I love Dead or Alive. But uh, if you have an idea for the top 10 list, reach out let me know. Uh, you can find me on all forms of social media at Scout Steve R. Of course, hit up Roy. Roy sometimes is easier to get a hold of. Uh, Roy made a trip out to Arizona State, too. They went to Vegas and went to watch one. He was all over the place. He was everywhere. When Roy takes these trips, man, he takes trips. Like, it's a work trip for me. It is a pleasure cruise for one Roy Samante, for sure. And he texts me, like, right before the game, said, hey, where are you? I didn't see the text, and so I was getting to the airport the, airport the next day. So, um, but yeah, you can find Roy on uh, Twitter or X at Dogmatic67. That's D A W G M A T I C 67. And you can find our great list over on Spotify. Spotify. Roy kind of maintains that channel for us. Uh, hit the subscribe button, doesn't cost you anything. And uh, if you're already a Spotify user, and then our great list was kind of auto populate. You never know when you're going to find a new band or maybe hear an old favorite. It's a big part of our show. I'm really happy to get your support. All these years, the top 10 list, it's hard to believe, man, we've been doing this now for four years and still finding cool things to talk about. All right, next segment of the show brought to you by Campus Book Mart, a Starkvillian institution. If you're looking for Mississippi State merchandise, look no further than Campus Book Mart. A lot of people claim to have the best selection of Mississippi State merch. They are pretenders to the throne. Miss Kathy Brown and staff there do an amazing job outfitting this fan base with everything they need to demonstrate their fandom, whether it be new apparel or gift ideas, things for your fan cave, your RV, your pet, whatever you need, Miss Kathy Brown can get it for you. When I go in there, I, I wish I could win the lottery, right? I just buy it all out, right, and give it to you guys, right? I, I would love, love, love to be able to get it all, you know? You can never have enough Mississippi State clothing, and I think it's a great thing that we go out and rep the brand. You can do that. By going by and seeing their smiling faces and perusing their fine selections at Campus Book Mart. If you can't make it to town, you can still support a wonderful Starkville business. We always believe in shopping local. Rather than go to Amazon, go to campusbookmart.net. Those are bulldogs, right? You know when you spend money with them, it's going to go back into Starkville, back into Mississippi State. Get the security of knowing that. Go to campusbookmart.net, and by being a loyal Boneyard listener, we'll give you a phrase that pays. That is BSR, which stands for Beautiful Steve Robertson. That gets you free shipping on all orders over $75. Any order less than $75, absolutely incomplete. 
All right, so uh, we have not had a chance to talk a little bit about the uh, Eric Taylor situation. You know, Eric Taylor was uh, announced on Monday, back-to-back weeks. Jeff Levy has announced that a certain player is no longer with us. You know, Jeffrey Pittman goes back uh, week one, and then now Eric Taylor. So two players, uh, I don't know if you would consider them dismissals or if they quit, but... Um, yeah, there are some uh, some circumstances involved with all that. We're not going to get into all that stuff. There are a couple things that I want to say about that. Um, I've had a couple players, former players, that have reached out. One from the Chrome era that said, "Hey, Steve, you know, sometimes you got to take time to clean out the tub before you put clean water in." You know, and, and there's some truth in that. Uh, Eric Taylor is a guy who was highly recruited out of high school, went to OSU, it didn't work out. He wound up at Southwest Mississippi Community College. We really thought we had something there. Got 15 tackles out of him last year. Uh, really has not emerged as a player we hoped he would be. He's been a little bit banged up, too, to be fair to him. But uh, obviously that is a position of need, and now we have a player that is no longer with us that could have at least provided some depth. Now, the point that I have with all of this is Jeff Lebby is making the right decisions for Mississippi State football. You cannot compromise the integrity of your program because of the fact, hey, you know, we, we can't afford to lose a defensive lineman. You can't do it. And listen, we know this year's a rebuilding year. Jeff doesn't think so. You know, Jeff's like, hey, we're not looking at it as a rebuild. We're going to go out here and try to win ball games and win, get a winning season and go to a bowl game. Obviously, that chore has been made more difficult by losing that game to Arizona State. It's true. Not a lot of margin for error for this team. But it would have been very easy for Jeff Levy to say, you know what, hey, the foundational standards of this program are fluid based on wins and losses. That's not how leadership works. The standards have to apply to all people. And think about your own working environment, right? Right. As long as the rules are applied uniformly and the consequences are universal for everybody involved, you know where you stand. You can't have this uh, you know, sliding rule here about, well, hey, these are what we're going to do, but man, if, if, we're, if we're winning or if we need this guy to give us the prospect of winning, then all of a sudden the standards don't apply. You, you can't live life that way. That's, that's building a house on sand, you guys all know the parable about that. And so, again, I know some of the details, but not enough that we're going to go write a story or make anything public about this stuff. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It all means the same thing. Gone, right? Gone. But here is the thing that I think is so important for Jeff Levy. Is right now, we talk about laying a foundation, but you are basically teaching players now what will be acceptable under your supervision at Mississippi State. And I've been a coach too, not at this level. And one of the things that I've learned about coaching, you know, sometimes, sometimes I got to go put somebody on the bench. And sometimes you got to cut somebody for the betterment of the team. You know, I, I give you guys a quick parable from my high school coaching days. But, uh, you know, we had a standing policy that when, it, when senior skip day happened at our high school, our baseball players did not participate in that. You were held to a different standard. You said, but Steve, it's senior skip day. I understand it's senior skip day. I understand that. But it is a privilege and an honor to wear the uniform of your respective institution. And those are the rules that have been applied for years. And so for about 20 years, since the senior skip day had kind of become a thing, the baseball players at Broadmoor High School did not participate. On his junior year, the seniors that year decided that they were going to participate in senior skip day, even though we had told them in the days leading up to that, we expect you to be at school. They didn't come to school, and they didn't play the next two games. We lost them both, and it cost us a chance to uh, advance and play in the playoffs when it was all said and done. And, you know, the thing that I think about is what did that mean the next year? We had a much better year the next year. We got a bad group of seniors that year, as evidenced by the fact that they thought the rules didn't apply to them. 
And as a result, everybody else on our team, you know, we had three guys that were starters that uh, – that didn't get to participate for a week, missed two district games. And um, when it all got down to it at the end of the year, you know, there were, there were some parents that were unhappy of how we handled that. And here's the thing that I'll tell you about that, is uh, the reason that those kids participated in senior skip day wasn't because of the leadership of their coaches. It was because of the leadership of their parents. Because typically – Kids that whine have parents that whine because kids just kind of parrot, parrot the behavior of others. And so how I equate that to what's happening right now at Mississippi State, and hopefully we don't have any other dismissals or guys leave the team. Hopefully that's the case. But one of our sources told us on the Eric Taylor situation, they didn't really know exactly what happened, but he was here one day and gone the next. You can't sacrifice the many to save the few. You know, Jeff Labby's employed by Mississippi State University. Jeff Labby has an obligation to me, to you, to Zach Selman, to Dr. Mark Keenum, to everybody that wears maroon and white, to be the caretaker of our program. We have entrusted a lot into the hands of Jeff Labby. It's not just to go up there and go to the press conference and call the plays on Saturday night. That's not where it ends. We're preparing young men for life. And as you've heard me say on this show many times, sadly, there's a whole generation of young men out there that the, uh, the most important role models, male role models in their lives are their high school coaches. And in some respects, they're junior college coaches and their college coaches. Who teaches them to be men? And so I don't know what's going to happen to Eric Taylor, but I know that every other player on this team learned a valuable lesson of what it is to be a man or just to be an adult. And I hate to you know, make that gender specific, but we're talking about young men here. You learn about accountability. And you can, keep, you can teach accountability without being a jerk. But people have to understand that there are some standards that you're not going to compromise. And the truth of the matter is, when you have foundational standards in your organization and say, hey, these, these things are not acceptable. You know, I know in what we do over Gene's page, there are some things that are not acceptable. And uh, when, it, when they occur, the wrath of your good friend and host comes down. Now, I'm a guy that recovers very quickly. It's one of the reasons that I've been able to stay married as long as I have. I'm not a person that really holds, you know, grudges. That's not to say there's people out there that I like everybody. I, I don't. I'll, I'll just say it for what it is. There are a lot of people I don't like. I don't hate anybody. I hate the way some people act sometimes. But, um, you know, we're all human here. But I, I think the most important aspect of this whole thing with you, know, you had the Jeffrey Pittman situation, and obviously, look, look, our running back room could use Jeffrey Pittman. Let's just kind of call it for what it is. The two personnel groups last weekend that we're all the most disappointed in, the running back room and the defensive line. And you got two guys that were expected to be contributors, not to be stars, but to be contributors. And listen, I think Jeff Pittman probably a better player than Eric Taylor, to be honest with you. He wasn't highly as recruited, but, you know, he was a guy that showed some flashes last year that he'd be able to help us. And so I think all this says a lot about the character of Jeff Levy and the culture that he's trying to build here at Mississippi State. It's like, hey, you may play a position of need, but if you run afoul of the rules, you're not going to be here. That, that's a very important lesson for people to understand. And it's a very visible example. See, it's one thing, right, when you're coaching high school baseball and, you know, somebody kind of pisses you off and you have them go run foul poles. They're, the kids can all see that. You know, but nowadays everybody's gotten so dadgum sensitive, it's very difficult to coach people because people's feelings get hurt, right? And so I mean, when the Russians show up, I mean, 50% of the population is going to join their side anyway, Right. And so the rest of us will have to fight, you know, a glorified version of Red Dawn 
because we're going to have a lot of people out there that are going to be more worried about their feelings but than about their responsibilities. But when you go, when you publish, when you, when you, I believe in criticism in private, but when you, when you have a situation where somebody has knowingly broke the rules, it's important for everybody else involved to understand that there was some disciplinary action taken, even if you don't know all the details. You want to protect the integrity of things. You don't want to embarrass people, but you've got to do what's best for the team as a whole. And so, you know, my interactions with Jeff Lebby have been very good. And um, I trust Jeff Lebby. And I, I think this is, in many respects, a very important part of his tenure here at Mississippi State. You know, one of the things, you know, when Mike Leach was here, right, we had, you know, a handful of guys that left. I mean, shortly after, uh, you know, allegedly, you know, there was some, uh, you know, let's just say some off the field uh, party favors that didn't jive with what Mike Leach felt Mississippi State football should have. And so those young men were no longer with the program anymore. And I go back to, um, you know, go back to the Joe Moorhead thing. And I remember writing an article and talking about it on this show shortly before Joe was uh, relieved of duty is that we had a culture problem at Mississippi State and I had some players on the team that didn't like it. And I had some that messaged me and told me you're not being fair. And I had some other people on the team message me and say, you know what, you're right. Things had kind of gotten out of control. We had, you know, veteran players not coming to bowl practices. We had people that kind of come and go as they wanted to. There has to be a level of accountability. You cannot manage a group of people when there is not a sense of law and order. These are the rules. These are the consequences. If you break the rule, these are, these are what's going to happen to you. Because here's what happens as a coach or as a manager, as a leader, as a shepherd, whatever right? When somebody breaks the rules and knowingly breaks the rules and you don't hold them accountable, you lose the team because they lose respect for you. It's like, hey, why should I listen to this guy? You know, he's letting so-and-so do this and -and so-and-so do that. Hey, if the rules don't apply to them, the rules don't apply to me. And there are a lot of people out there that want to be rule breakers anyway. And it's not to say they want to be criminal. But they're not going to do things by policy and procedure if they're not directed to. If they find out that those things are optional, why would they ever do it? They'd never do it. It's like, okay, guys, here's what we're going to do, right? And I go back to when I was in high school, when I was a soccer player at Columbia High School. And I love being from Columbia. There's a rumor here as of late that I don't claim Columbia. I don't know where that comes from. But um, I guess small-town jealousy never ends. But, uh, But all that I understood, I remember... Coach Delman Eubanks is our coach. I guess we go back a year to Mark Yeager. And, uh, you know, we had to run as part of our warm-up. We'd have to run a half mile. We'd warm up, stretch, run a half mile, and then we would, you know, do drills, and then we would scrimmage, and then we'd run two miles after practice. I don't know if kids today could do that. But the thing that I remembered is um, – I would run my eight laps. And sometimes I may have to walk. I'd get a little stitch in the side or whatever, but I'd have to run those laps. And I remember some of those upperclassmen. And when coach wasn't looking, they would all go hide. You know, there was like some, some brush that was kind of grown up because there was some construction over there. And so when coach wasn't looking, they would go hide and let the group come back around and they would skip a lap. And what's interesting about that is uh, I was a sophomore then, and that's those seniors never got to experience a victory. Now, the JV we did. You know, I was a sophomore playing JV and varsity, but uh, the seniors of a first-year program never got to know what it was like to win a game. The next year we did. Once we got those guys out of there, once we got those corner cutters out of there, we began to win some games began to be more competitive. And it's not just a measure of talent. I'm a firm believer in this. When you work hard, God, God blesses your labor. You got to go do the work, right? And what's interesting, too, is those same guys who were hiding behind the brush as everybody else is running their laps, I go back and look and see what they've done with their lives since then. Not much. Not much. 
And so we talk about America, and we're not going to talk about the debate and things like that. I think one of the things that, that made America you know, a superpower is the fact that we didn't cut corners. And so when we get to this whole thing with Jeff Labbing and these disciplinary things, if Jeff starts cutting corners, then players cut corners. One of the most important lessons I learned about managing people is that employees that don't follow policy have managers that don't follow policy. I mean, how many times do you walk into a retail establishment and you know, things are not clean, you know? Uh, I used to run a furniture store. I used to get there every morning an hour before everybody else and I'd walk to salespeople's sections. I'd walk their sections. And if you had a, uh, a you know pricing tag that was missing or one that had like a dog ear that was bent and it didn't look great, I'd make a notes. So when everybody get in every day, they'd have notes for their sections, what needed to be fixed, what needed to be changed. And eventually, those mornings that I would come in and walk sections, the notes got a lot shorter because you teach people. They begin to learn, hey, well, here's what he's looking for. So you know what I'm going to do before I leave today? I'm going to go work my section to ensure that my section's ready to go tomorrow and we open for business. And isn't that what I want, right? And so I, I take all that and I, I just tell you this whole thing, I, and I've seen some some people out there, oh, we really needed this guy. Listen, I'm going to be honest with some of you guys. Most of you didn't know who Eric Taylor's name was until he got dismissed. You heard about him being announced as a signee on signing day. You hadn't thought about him since. And now all of a sudden we're an expert. Oh, what a huge loss for us, you know. And listen, I don't always write all those headlines, right? Not everything that gets shared by the network is something that we wrote. But let's not just look for a reason to be miserable. There's a lot of things that we can be upset about right now. But again, I believe in Jeff Levy. And I think what, how he has handled his disciplinary stuff is even further confirmation that he is the right guy for us. You know, we are a blue-collar people. And some people don't like to hear that. But that's who we are. We are a program and a university built on hard work. We have never been people of privilege. Everything that we've gotten at Mississippi State, we've had to work and earn. Period. The Southeastern Conference has never just rolled over and handed us anything in any sport. You think about our, our conference peers, a lot of them look down upon us, but they know this, when we have a good team, they know they better bring a sack lunch when they line up against Mississippi State in any sport because we're going to outwork them. And that's one of the reasons, like, you think about some of the coaches over the years that have been so successful here, right? People that have valued work. We value hard work. Many of us are descendants of Mississippi farmers. I know I am, right? A thankless job allows me an opportunity at this point to, to tell all you folks that are working in the farming industry now, thank you. Thank you for clothing and feeding us and doing a job that most people couldn't do or wouldn't do. You keep this country moving, and we appreciate you. I love you all. But that's who we are. We talk about recruiting all the time. You can go out and recruit who you want, but you're going to sign who you are. Those are the people that are going to gravitate to you, people that share your values. You're not going to be able to go out and sign Deion Sanders when you're the ag school. You're not. You see, but Stevie went to Florida State. Completely different dynamic back then. Not to mention Bobby Bowden, those guys kind of had the train rolling, Right? So you're not going to be able to go out there and get the guy that kind of values the, you know, the, you know, the party over the process. You're not going to go get a guy that you know, would rather go to Las Vegas and go to Stark Vegas. It's just not going to happen that way. And I think it's so important that we bring in leaders academically and athletically that understand these are the, young, the kinds of young people that you're going to deal with here at Mississippi State. you got to understand their value system. you got to understand their upbringing. you got to understand what they value in life. And I think that's exactly what Jeff Lebby's doing. You know, Jeff Lebby, you got you know, coach's son himself. Understands. Nothing's more important than the team and the integrity of the team. You start compromising who you are to get something, you're going to lose track of who you are. You'll start being what people expect you to be instead of who you know to be. 
And that's not who we hired. We didn't hire a chameleon. We hired a guy to come in here and be a leader and take this program forward. You know, we want a football program we can be proud of. And I, I saw recently, too, after the Arizona State game, like, I, I don't want to embarrass the guy. Some of you may know him. And I'm, I'm just – this sentiment is what I'm talking about, not necessarily the individual. The guy's like, hey, are you guys embarrassed yet? And the answer to that question is no. No. You will never know a day when Steve Robertson is embarrassed to be a Mississippi State guy. Ever. 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 This university educated my dad, allowed my family to have a better life. It's educated two of my daughters, educated my youngest son now. You know, I was there when John Bond and the boys beat Alabama November 1st, 1980. I was there when Mississippi State won the first ever national championship in college baseball. You know, I was there for those things. So, so no, one, one bad Saturday or a bad season – or a bad coaching tenure is not going to change my opinion and my love and admiration for this university. So no, sir, I'm not embarrassed. I understand that young people are going to go out there and do the best they can, or at least I hope so. And they're going to be wearing the same logo that you and I wear, and they're going to represent us. And sometimes they're going to lose. And so no, sir, I'm not embarrassed by their efforts. Not embarrassed by their sacrifice and not embarrassed by the result. I take a lot of pride in being a Mississippi State Bulldog. And I hope that you do too. And I wish there were more people that felt like I do. I want what's best. I don't want the status quo. And sometimes that involves, you know, maybe some bickering of sorts between the powers that be. But I understand this. I understand no matter who's in charge and no matter who's wearing a uniform, when the Bulldogs take the field or the court, they're going to have my undying support. Period. And when they win, I'm going to celebrate with them. And when they lose, I'm going to be upset too. But no, sir. I'm never going to be embarrassed to be a Mississippi State Bulldog. All right, final segment of the show brought to you by the Stark Vegas Clubhouse. Just Google Stark Vegas Clubhouse. Their Facebook page will come up. You can peruse to find amenities that are available to you and your guests when you book your stay at the Stark Vegas Clubhouse. Conveniently located, it's five minutes away from the Mississippi State campus, but tucked away in a quiet little section of our county where you uh, have the opportunity to go out there and just kind of have some peace and quiet you don't have a lot of these interlopers. Like if you go out there and you go, you rent five hotel rooms, you're going to have to go kind of patchwork this thing together. You go down to the lounge for an adult beverage. you got people hanging out down there that, that you don't know. And, you know, it's just kind of uncomfortable, right? You also got to go out to eat. You know, that's the thing, too. When you go stay at the Stark Vegas Clubhouse, it's a full-service kitchen. Great equipment there, too. So you can uh, buy groceries to, you know, cook throughout your stay. Save some money on that uh, vending machine down the hallway at the hotel, too, because you can go buy you know enough uh, snacks to last you. Yeah, and then that back porch area is amazing. It absolutely is. And that's one of the things, too. It's kind of an underappreciated part of that facility. Huge back porch area. You can stretch out and relax, watch the sunset, maybe have an adult beverage. Starting to cool off a little bit, too. You can go uh, fire up the fire in the fire pit. Sit around there. Conversations around the fire are just more meaningful. I don't make the rules. I just enforce them. So when you Google the Stark Vegas Clubhouse, some booking options are going to pop up too. Right? You're going to have Airbnb or VRBO. You can go that route if you want to. But if you want to save some money, I can help you. Book through the Evolve website. Get 10% off your stay. Promo code BSR10. BSR10. The number 10. And get 10% off your stay. It doesn't matter who you book with, right? It's, it matters how much you pay. The facility is going to be the same. So let me encourage you to do that. Book through the Evolve website. Uh, best place to stay in the Golden Triangle when you're bringing a large group of folks to town. And, and, you know, we don't do it enough. Do We always say it. Hey, we need to get together more. We'll get together more at the Stark Vegas Clubhouse. Get your college roommates together. Get all of your uh, sorority sisters that, uh, that you've maintained relationships with. 
unless everybody meet up, spend some time together. You know, life is short, death is certain. Uh, plan a big event for you and your friends and family at the Stark Vegas Clubhouse. All right, uh, we would be remiss if we did not honor today. You know, it is uh, 9-11, and uh, that's a day that none of us will ever forget. I suspect, like you, I remember exactly where I was when it all happened. And uh, I was in the retail furniture business back then. And, uh, you know, sitting down, you know, just kind of getting ready to go to work. And you turn on TV and there's a report that the tower is smoking. You're like, hey, there was a, a, an accident with a plane. You know, it's like, wow, this is wild stuff. And then as the live footage is being shown, the second plane hit the second tower, and it's like, this is no accident. You know, we're under attack. We just didn't know who was responsible. I don't want to sit here and recount the day's events. I'd like to talk about kind of what happened in the days following that event. We talk about how divisive things are these days. And, uh, you know, I, I don't have a point of reference. So I can't think back, you know, a few years back and say, oh, it was so bad and so divisive. It always is around Election Day. It, all, it always is. And I don't know that either side helps themselves with all the tribalism, to be quite honest with you. I don't want to get political here today. But uh, I know there was the debate last night, and I don't think anybody's minds are changed. You know, most people tune in to see their candidate, to see how they'll do against the other, and then they'll declare victory, whether there was a victory or not. It's how life works. People get caught up in the echo chamber. But after 9-11, there was a sense of patriotism in this country that I have never seen before. It seems like we go from licking our wounds to kind of rallying in the troops. And I remember there were so many American flags, like everywhere you went, people had the American flags flying on their car. They couldn't keep them at Walmart because people wanted to go out and get the, uh, the stars and stripes as a reminder to each other that, hey, we're in this thing together. And while we may disagree about a lot of major issues that we have been the victims of a, a very cowardly attack on our nation. A lot of us quit watching network TV and we were glued to the news to see how we were going to respond, to see if there were any survivors found. And we began to hear some of the surviving stories and it, it made us even angrier. Tonight, you'll get a chance to watch 920 which is the Mississippi State movie about the first game after 9-11. South Carolina was the first team to fly. And it sounds kind of silly in hindsight, but the reality of it is, is it was a big deal. I'm eager to watch this thing tonight. I encourage you to watch it. And some of you may be you know, dealing with more pressing matters with the storm. But uh, I'm looking forward to watching it. I know some of the story. I'm eager to know all the story. I think it's probably going to be a great production we look forward to watching that but we have lost a lot since then and i don't mean mississippi state i mean the united states we have lost a sense in many respects of who we are and our reliance on each other a lot of people out there doing jobs that you and i don't want to do that are necessary to keep this country moving forward and i wish in many respects, that we could recapture some of that without another tragedy, right? Yeah, you know, the COVID thing was different, right? Because people even politicized all that. But there's nothing stopping us from being good to each other. There's nothing stopping us from saying, hey, this is my country, this is my home. I take pride in being an American, I take pride in being a part of this wonderful country with you. There's nothing that prevents that from happening. Oh, maybe our ego, our pride. You know, there are a lot of things that happen in the United States that, that don't give me a sense of pride. There are a lot of things that uh, we talk about. I'll never be embarrassed to be, you know, bulldog. I'll never be embarrassed to be an American, but there are some people out there that go extra <laughs> to try and embarrass the rest of us to, in, in the sake of getting engagement. But I love this country, and I remember this past weekend, 
being at Arizona State and I saw Pat Tillman's jersey. They're selling them right there at the venue. I thought about buying one. And for those of you that don't know or you've forgotten, Pat Tillman, of course, was a former Arizona Cardinals football player. He was a hero to those people. And uh, he retired from the NFL and joined the military to go fight terrorism in a foreign land. He was sadly killed by foreign fire. But there was a lot of people with that same sentiment that maybe didn't have as high a profile. There were a lot of people that said, that's it. I got to do what I got to do. I got to go protect America. I got to protect my family. I got to protect the people I care about. Kind of reminiscent of what happened in this country after Pearl Harbor. And you can read about that a little bit in the Duty Noble book, The Dude. But there are so many things that have happened in my lifetime that you look at and say, hey, this was a kind of a defining moment. I don't know if there was a, a greater defining moment in our lifetime, those of us in Gen X, than 9 11. And we talk about music and fashion and things of that nature and movies and all these things that, that kind of make up the minutia of life. But on that day, on 9-11, we began to think about our own lives and the lives of our children. The entertainment world didn't matter quite as much. And I remember thinking as I was writing that article, previewing the South Carolina game for Gene's Page back then, writing my game preview, predicting, uh, you know, games, you know, the Pickham's column. And I was, I was overcome with this sense of, uh, of sadness and anxiety uh, thinking about my oldest son, Ani, thinking about that he may have to join the military, thinking that he may have to go fight in a foreign land to defend our way of life here in the United States. And it struck me then I, I didn't want that. I didn't want that to happen. I was like, this thing could drag on forever. This could be World War III. This could be Armageddon. And my child could be on the front lines fighting for us. And there were many people in my age back in those days, you know, even though they were kind of aged out of military status, they went and rejoined the military because this is what we feel like we need to do. And it reminds me again, there's so many people that sign up for that anyway. You know, they don't need the national tragedy. It's like, hey, I'm going to go serve my country. And for all of you that do, thank you. We don't say it enough. We salute you. But it seems like, you know, when times get tough, we're always saying, hey, we're dependent on these people, but those people are doing a job for us every single day. I remember when all the war footage popped up, you know, the shock and awe. And it was a part of us, even those of us that, uh, you know, are somewhat, um, you know, pe you know peace-loving folks. I think we all should be. I understand that war is necessary. And it's not a war that we started. It's a war we finished. It's not a war we started. But I remember when I began to see the troops ship out, and began to see the Marines, the ships all make their way to the Persian Gulf. I remember thinking then, these folks don't know what they've done. They think they do, but they don't know that the greatest fighting force in the history of the world was headed over there to get revenge and to get justice. And those of us that may have difficult and different political leanings, we all kind of said, you know what, this is necessary. It is necessary. You have to show these people that we're not going to be a soft target. We talk about holding people accountable in, in work and football and things of that nature. you got to hold people accountable in life, too. When somebody comes to your country with an unprovoked attack, you've got a right to defend yourself. I wish that conflict could be resolved with a pen and paper. I really do. I wish that was the case. I wish we could get things resolved without the loss of life. That is not the world in which we live. But the thing, when I look back at 9-11, is I was so incredibly proud of America and our response 
and the way we as a people came together. And I remember too, the people began to wear the yellow ribbons, you know, until the troops came home. And there were so many people that went and did a job that you and I didn't want to do, or maybe we weren't capable of doing, to enable us to continue to argue with one another on Facebook. Days like today, I think it's important to take an inventory. Take an inventory of where we are as people and where we are as a society. The thing that I was uh, happy to see this morning is, oh yeah, on my Facebook feed and Twitter feed and that kind of stuff, a few things about the debate last night You know that really accomplishes nothing. I mean, it's basically just entertainment. It's like reality TV. But I love the memes that were going around about 9-11 today. And I think the best one that I saw is the best way to honor the victims of 9-11 is for us to be the people we were on September 12th, on 9-12. And that's what happens in life, right? You get a little trauma, right? You know, and we talk about, you know, God's supposed to be our steering wheel and not our spare tire. That's what happens. Oh, we blow a flat or we have some some issues in life and all of a sudden now it's like hey i need some divine intervention here where are you you know know, rather than having a daily conversation or relationship you know and i'm not going to have an altar call here but the thing that i was struck by when i go back and watch those 9-11 documentaries is when they show those people fleeing the falling towers and it's hard to watch it is but there were a couple phrases you heard over and over again And it was, oh God, no Jesus. Oh God, oh God, oh God. Let that sink in for a second. We're in the middle of one of the greatest crises in the history of the United States. The people that are fleeing the carnage of that are crying out and calling out for help. And I'm sure there were some people too calling for police and calling for rescues, but by and large, you heard people calling out to God. Now, I don't know who you worship or how you worship or what you do. I don't know. But I know this. I know that my life is so much better because of the fact that I have a regular conversation with my higher power. And that's one of the things, too. You know, I grew up in a very religious family, and uh, I use that term higher power really, not that I'm scared of offending anybody, but that's just kind of the concept that we were taught. And in the beginning of my sobriety, I, would, I would, really wasn't ready you know, to kind of acknowledge the biblical God and things like that. Even though I've been raised in a church and you know, raised in a Levite tribe, you know, my great-grandfather was a minister, my grandfather was a minister, my uncle was a minister, my brother married a missionary's daughter, he went to Bible college. I mean, it was just so many of that stuff in my family. you know. But I had to go through my own search of meaning. I had to figure out, am, am I believing what I believe because of what I've taught or because it's true? And so I had to go on my own search. And uh, I, I will promise you this. As I was getting sober and got into recovery, it's really when I began to kind of find you know, really who God is. You know, I'm not going to preach to you here. And again, you know, you're the one that has to face your maker someday, you know, so you can believe how you want. But after 9-11, I had such a renewal of faith because I knew that we could not fix this alone. Right, left up to our own devices, you know, we would uh, we would have been destroyed as a nation, and maybe we still will be. You know, a lot of people think uh, you know the United States is Babylon when it's all said and done, and certainly many of us have lived that way. But I'm very nostalgic today about those days when we loved each other. It didn't matter, right? All those people running through the streets of New York, fleeing death. Nobody asked him, hey, who did you vote for? Who'd you cheer for in a Super Bowl? Where do you live? How much money do you make? Where do you go to church? Nobody asked those questions. They said, can you help me? Or do you need help? Or hey, run this way. Follow me. We were just people. We were just people. And I think at the end of the day, 
when you get down to the primal truth of it all, that's really the way it was intended, is for us to be people, to look out for each other. And I think it's a stark reminder to us on today, on 9-11, for us to go back and look and say, hey, we need to focus less on the things that divide us and more on the things that unite us. You know, elections don't do that. You know, there are times that rivalries don't do that. But I think at our core, you know, of course, uh, you know, our, our family has to come first. And then there is our secondary family, you know, those that we're sharing a planet with, those that we're sharing a society with. And listen, that's not to say that everybody's a good person. That's just simply a naive belief that is not supported by any facts. Not everybody out there is going to add value to your life. Doesn't mean you don't have some commonality and some respect for them. But while we all share a planet, we don't always share the same vision and the same goals in life. And when people come and attack our nation, they have to be held accountable. And again, you go back to you know Pearl Harbor. The United States has proven time and time again that if you attack us unprovoked, we're going to respond in a very extraordinary fashion. And so my hope is today that maybe for a little while and maybe just for today, that we can go back and kind of begin to remember what that felt like. You know, for us to grieve the fallen, and there were so many brave men and women uh, that ran into those buildings that never came out alive. And there are a lot of people that miss them, even to this day. I know, I know this is a hard day. And I believe it was Corey Banks who played for uh, Mississippi State back then that his uh, sister was driving by in New York and uh, was killed. I believe that's correct. I believe it was Corey Banks. And uh, perhaps that's mentioned in the documentary tonight. I, I don't know. But my, I hope that you'll watch it. And I hope that it'll stir up some of those same old feelings again about how we felt. And, you know, we lost a ball game. And it was terrible, right, for us to lose. But of all the games that we've lost, that's the one I thought, you know what, I'm just glad we played. I'm just glad that we had a game and and, uh, our nation needed a bit of a distraction and a chance to get back to normal. There were so many people who were fearful that, you know, if we put these large groups together, that we were going to have, you know, make ourselves targets for more terrorist attack. And there's probably some truth in that. I I tell you, I remember when, um, wasn't long after that, Ani was fighting in the Minneapolis Metrodome at a Taekwondo event in uh, Minnesota, obviously, and uh, we're all sitting there and you hear a plane coming over and you see the silhouette of the plane go over the Metrodome and and you could hear an audible gasp, like, oh, because we don't want to be victims. But in the end, some of us will prove to be. And not necessarily because we volunteered for something. You know, sometimes good people die for no reasons of their own. Unfortunately, That's the reality of life. But I know this. Before that day comes, we can make our country, our city, our towns, our counties, the world a better place by having a little more love for one another, a little more respect for each other. You know, uh, don't mistake kindness for weakness. I'm one of those kinds of people, too. It's like if you, there won't be beef unless you start any. But if you start some, it's going to be trouble, right? That's how I feel, right? But I remember after 9-11, it's like so much of that, like all the little things that used to irritate us so much, we learned a new level of patience for each other. And I wish we could recapture that. I truly do. And so, again, I encourage you to watch the documentary 920 tonight. Uh, Mississippi State produced that. Uh, part of our new um, football production group. Uh, I'm very eager to see it. We have some very talented individuals involved with that group. And uh, it will give you some insight into that football game and really all the details kind of leading up to that. And so uh, we look forward to seeing that uh, tonight. And so let's get out of here. Again, if you hadn't done so, go to dutynoblebook.com. You can pre-order the dude to be out uh, about four weeks. And uh, in addition to that, too, all of my sports titles are there. And uh, When the Bottom Falls, also there, too, if you're looking for that book. Um, If you have friends in recovery or friends that are dealing with 
Chemical Dependency. That may be a good book for, for you to get for yourself and maybe buy a copy for them in hopes that they'll read it. And if you hadn't floated, you need to come float too. You talk about finding a level of peace and understanding for everybody. Uh, we can help you relax. And, and uh, we've had a lot of student athletes as of late too. And um, it's been a lot of fun. Go to 662-268-7601. You can call speak directly to my wife, Dana, and uh, she can answer your questions and get you booked and, and kind of let you know what it's about. Of course, you can download the True Rest app and uh, book without having to speak to anybody. But uh, let's have a great week, folks. We'll be back on Friday, and uh, we'll give a little bit of recap of the 920 documentary. We'll begin to preview the weekend. That's what happens in college football. It seems like once we get rolling, man, things just kind of keep going. It seems like the calendar just runs and runs and runs. It's like it's Labor Day, and you, you close your eyes, and it's Thanksgiving, right? That's how it works. And it seems like when you're winning, they go by even faster. We need to get a win this weekend. And, again, I, I hope and trust that we absolutely do. But until next time, let's all live our lives in a way we make more friends than enemies and people can see a difference in the way we live.